beloved child of God. And what we're going to be doing over the next five weeks is exploring our identity, who we are to God, who God is to us, um, with the recognition that uh, understanding our relationship with God changes the way that we live and we move and we have our being in the world. It changes how we act, it changes how we think, it changes how we feel when we understand ourselves um, properly in relationship to God. So uh, sometimes during worship series, people will express uh, to us that they would like to talk about sermons or, or worship series a little bit more deeply. It's great to come to worship and, and to be able to, uh, you know, hear a sermon or hear music or sing music that goes with the theme. Uh, but sometimes people like to offer their own voices to that. Uh, and that sometimes happens through our small group system. Our ongoing small groups will sometimes have discussions about what is talked about on, in Sunday worship. A couple of times a year, we of course have the opportunity to engage in books that relate to the worship series too, and many of our small groups um, take on those books. We have additional small groups that pop up and do that. Um, but a lot of our small groups break for the summertime. They, they no longer um, go during the summertime until the fall starts up again. And the other thing is, this is a really personal sermon series. kind of hits home. It really hits at the heart of who we are and, and what we think about ourselves. So we thought this would be a great opportunity to take on a couple uh, sermon discussion groups and storytelling times on Sundays after our 1030 worship service so that we could explore these things more deeply um, since our small groups aren't going on and so th- since this is such a personal um, personal. Um, topic. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, on June 9th, uh, we'll be taking on what does, uh, what does, what is it like to have God love us? What does that feel like? And then on June 30th, we'll be talking about how that shapes our identity and who we are in the world. Bring a dish to pass and we'll just have a conversation around tables down in the fellowship hall. You are all invited to that. So we are kicking off uh, this worship series Thinking about the relationship between a parent and a child. We're going to focus on that today. I want to start out by acknowledging that not all of us have positive relationships, have positive parent-child relationships. That um, some of us have some strain there. We all have a certain amount of strain no matter what. Uh, But some of us experience that strain more than others. And uh, that makes a difference for how we understand this metaphor of God being a parent and us being a child. The relationship that we have with our own parents and we have with our own children impacts whether this metaphor of God as the parent and us as the children actually works for us. Developmental psychologists will say that the most foundational relationship in a person's life is the parent-child relationship, that that shapes us and um, impacts all of the other relationships that we have in our life. So positive interactions, of course, have significant power in our life as strained and difficult interactions have for us. They also have a significant of power in our life. Now, I have um, a son who is graduating from high school next Saturday. (sighs) Breathe, breathe, breathe. (laughs) Like even saying that, (laughs) it's like, oh. Um, So for those of you who have had children who have had this milestone, you probably kind of know what I am experiencing right now. Uh, I am just having like all these memories bubble up inside me. Like I am just like thinking back on this now adults, whole life and just thinking about um, who he is and how he was when he was little and, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Um, So, but one of the memories that I've been thinking about is um, those first days with him. So, you know, the experience of, you know, you bring this baby into your household and uh, it took me a little while to get over the shock of how difficult this all was going to be. 
But once I got over the kind of the shock about how hard it was to care for another human being fully, um, I fell completely head over heels in love with this little human being that was brought into my life. And I remember it thinking that these emotions were so powerful, so intense, that nobody else in the history of the universe could possibly have felt what I am feeling right now because it was so strong and so powerful. And of course you all know, nope, you weren't the only one. And when people would ask me what it was like, I would say, you know, it's strange. It's like my life went from black and white TV to color HD in that first year with him and falling in love with him. Well, we got pregnant with our second child. Her name is Faith. And I got to tell you, as we were preparing for her uh, entering our family, I was having a pretty significant amount of anxiety about this. And I know that I am not alone in this anxiety because I have had other parents express to me the same concerns that I was having at that point. I was wondering things like, I love him so much, Samuel, so much. How could I possibly love another child as much as I love Samuel? Or I was thinking to myself, like, the love that I, like, now I'm going to have for this other child, is it going to take away from the love that I have for Samuel? Like, these were thoughts that were rolling through my head, and in talking to other parents, I know that other parents have these concerns too, but of course you know you have that next child, and uh, the love is not limited, is it? It just grows and grows and grows, and there's more of it available, and yes, you do feel the same way about your second child as you do about your first, and, and, um, and that love grows, it doesn't get taken away. So by the time I got uh, decided we were going to have a third child, I figured out, okay, this is probably going to repeat itself, right? So I didn't have anxiety over, you know, whether I was going to have enough love or it was going to take away from my other kids. Instead, I had nightmares about leaving my third child at home. Like I would just forget her because she's the third kid. So here is my three monkeys. Uh, quite a bit ago, the, the oldest one there is 18 now, and I don't know which, what, what kind of parent uh, puts their newborn in a wheelbarrow <laughs> with a rake and a four-year-old and two-year-old. I apparently thought it would be a cute picture. Uh, so there's my three kids. The intensity of this doesn't just go one way though, right? It's not just that the parents feel the intensity of this and the power of this. The children also feel the intensity of this and the power of this. If you think back to when you were a child, take a moment, think back when you were a child. There probably was a certain portion of your life that you thought your parents were absolutely perfect. That does stop eventually. But you remember that feeling of putting your full trust, safety, and security into them, that they were the most important thing in your life Everything revolved around them. I kind of marvel at this human experience that we have with the child-parent relationship. It's, um, it's miraculous. It's, it's amazing. It's marvelous that we have this. And, of course, we try to explain it. There's biological explanations for it, that there's brain chemicals and hormones that are going on that explain this relationship. There's psychological explanations for it that um, there's, a, there's attachment theories out there about why this happens. And there's sociological explanations for it. Uh, sociologists believe that the strength of a whole society is based on the strength of the family unit. So that's an explanation for it. But regardless of the, of the explanation, we know Like I said earlier, this relationship is the foundation of all other relationships that we have had, which is why we have to work through these difficulties when there's been strain or tension in it. And I am amazed by those who have done that hard work um, of reconciliation or moving on for um, one's own self-well-being. 
Well, given the intensity of the relationship, given the power of the relationship, given the foundational nature of the relationship, it is no surprise that this is an image or metaphor that we use to describe the relationship between God and human beings too. In fact, this metaphor and this image is so ingrained into our Christian faith, we probably can't even conceive of our relationship with God any different than a parent-child relationship because we've been um, socialized to believe that that's what it's been like. But the reality is that through human history, that actually always hasn't been the case. That people's images or views of God haven't always been rooted in the relationship of a parent-child relationship. At times, um, at the time that the Old Testament was written, or much of the Old Testament was written, each culture had its own perception of God, and they were different. So... um, There's all these cultures that are out there, and they each have their own different images of God. And many of the images of God were like warrior gods, or king gods, or animal gods. And what they had in common with each other is that the God was um, often very aggressive, and sometimes even borderline on violence, violent. And the number one attribute of these gods was strength. Well, at that time, all these little cultures and these societies were fighting with each other for land. And what would happen is one society would come in, be stronger, and take over and occupy another culture. And the first thing that the occupiers did when they went in, one of the first things that they did when they went in, was to destroy all the religious symbols and artifacts. And here's why. Because they wanted to make the people believe that their God was dead. Gods could live and die. So if culture A came in, took over culture B, destroyed its religious artifacts, made the people believe that their God was dead, what are the people going to do? Well, they would start worshiping the God of the culture who was occupying them. Because, of course, that culture's God must be stronger that God, that culture's God won. Our God is dead. That God is alive. Let's start worshiping that God. Well, the ancient Israelites at that time, who eventually became the Jewish people, they had different metaphors for God than warrior and aggressor. Yes, king was an image that was used, and God was definitely strong, and yes, They respected God, but the strength and respect that they attributed to God was more about awe and wonder than it was about aggressiveness and violence. And they brought a completely different metaphor to the mix, too. They started talking about God as a father, as a protector, not as an aggressor, but a protector, a God that loved his children so much that they could rely and trust in this God. This is really different than what the cultures around the Israelite people viewed their gods to be. Now, this is important because eventually the Israelite people were taken over by some superpowers around them. And unlike all the other cultures who simply uh, started worshiping other gods, they never stopped worshiping their god. Because the prophets and the priests at that time insisted that there is only one god, first commandment. There is only one god, and this god demands our fidelity. This This god wants us to only worship this god, and in order to be in relationship with this god, there is some rules and laws that we need to follow. Deuteronomy uh, 32 talks about uh, what I've been speaking to, uh, how there's all these different gods and what this God of the Israelite people uh, believed. Is the Lord your God not your Father who created you, who made you and established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years long past 
Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High apportioned the nations, when he divided humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the gods. The Lord's own portion was his people, Jacob, his allotted share. He sustained him in the desert land, in a howling wilderness waste. He shielded him, cared for him, guarded him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, as it spreads its wings, takes them up and bears them aloft on its pinions, the Lord alone guided him. No foreign god was with him. He set him atop the heights of the land and fed him with produce from the, from the field. The ancient Israelites' understanding. Well, eventually this guy named Jesus comes along. Anybody know this guy Jesus? So, anybody, so eventually this guy Jesus comes along and he is recognized as being something special. The words son of man and son of God are used to describe Jesus. And there appeared to be some kind of very special parent-child relationship between Jesus and God the Father. And that particularly shows up in Jesus' baptism. Uh, Jesus happens upon the Jordan River. His uh, cousin, John the Baptist, is baptizing, baptizing people there. And Jesus says, me too, me too, me too. So John uh, decides, yep, let's, let's baptize Jesus here, and this is what happens in that moment. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus starts telling stories and teaching people, and in his stories, Jesus extended the breadth and the depth of God's love beyond what the people previously understood. More than a parent protector, more than a parent that we respect or are in awe of, more than a parent that insists that we follow the rules of the household, Jesus brings a personal nature of God into the conversation. Jesus tells a story about a father and two sons, which really help the people understand what kind of relationship we should have with God. The father was wealthy, so he divvied out some of his wealth to his two sons. And one of the sons decided that he was going to stay home and work for dad. The other son decided he was going to take his money and he was going to go spend it. So he did. He went and spent it. He squandered it away and made some really bad decisions in his life and eventually ended up homeless, desolate, in this really deep, dark place. And while he was in this deep, dark place, he thinks to himself, you know what? i got to go home. I don't know if I can go home. How do I go home? Maybe if I ask my dad to be a slave, then I can go home. So the son decides to head home, and as he's going up the walk, uh, here's how the story goes. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. The father ran and put his arms around the son and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is now found. And they begin to celebrate. Well, this, this image of a God as a parent doesn't stop there. This guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul, comes along, and he shakes things up even more. Prior to Paul, uh, the Jewish people understood themselves to be the chosen people of God. They were the elect. They were the tribe that was uh, picked 
to be part of God's family. Uh, they were the chosen people. They were the people underneath the covenant. It was an exclusive club. Well, Paul comes along and Paul completely disrupts this notion. He insists that non-Jews, at that time it was the Gentiles, are also children of God through their faith. And the image that's used is the image of adoption, that, that we are all one big family. And this was really powerful for the Gentiles at this time because the Gentiles' religion is what we think of as Greek mythology. And the gods as part of Greek mythology were petty and they were jealous and human beings really were not interested in having any kind of personal relationship with these gods. But then this guy, Paul, comes along and he starts talking about a different kind of God. God of love, God of acceptance, a God that would accept them into the covenant and include them into the covenant. And they thought, can it be true? It was true. It seemed like it was too good to be true, but it wasn't. They were able to believe it. Paul wrote a letter to uh, the Gentiles, the church of Ephesus, and this is what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Friends, these are stories of our faith. These are the stories of our faith. These are the stories of the people who have gone before us and taught us the way we use their stories to help understand our story. And in each of these stories, there is a realization of how to understand God, how we see God and how God sees us. The ancient Israelites had a recognition. Unlike those around them that were worshiping aggression, they knew a God of protection and loyalty, a God who's got their back. People at the time of Jesus had a realization. Maybe connecting with God was more than just respecting God and following the rules of the household. Maybe God was like this father in this story of the prodigal son running towards them, embracing them even in their deepest, darkest time. The Gentiles at the time of Paul, they had a realization. Maybe they weren't excluded Maybe they could be accepted. Maybe they could be loved. Maybe they could be given this this grace, this forgiveness. Maybe this wasn't too good to be true. And they believed it. Just as this long history of faith that has gone before you had these realizations, I hope that you are confronted with the radical nature of God's love in your life, too. I hope that you have new realizations about who God is to you and who you are to God. I hope that you know that you have a God who falls completely head over heels for you and that that recognition is powerful, impactful, intense, and foundational for you. I hope that you know that you have a God that runs towards you with open arms. And I hope that realization takes your life from black and white living into color HD. And I hope you know that you are fully included, fully accepted as a child of God, no barriers. And I hope that realization makes you wonder Has anyone ever in the history of the universe felt this way? People of the Grove, you are loved. You are loved. You are beloved. Be loved. Amen.